So uh, it's a great pleasure to have Pavitran Ayer here from Sanadu Quantum Technologies. And he's going to tell us about evaluating fault tolerance schemes for noisy carbon. So Pavitran, please take it. Uh, thank you so much, Onkar. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot to Vijay and Onkar for uh, giving me this opportunity and organizing this talk at TFR. And uh, today my plan is to tell you about a few of my works that fall under the umbrella of evaluating fault tolerance schemes for noisy uh, quantum hardware. And uh, I I currently work as a senior scientist at the startup uh, that. Uh, Builds quantum computers called Xanadu Quantum Technologies. Okay, so diving into the talk. Uh, firstly, hey. thanks to all my collaborators that helped me learn the field throughout uh, since I was an uh, undergrad student at CMI. And in particular, I'll be talking about uh, the work that I have done with these four collaborators David Pullen, who is my uh, PhD supervisor, who is unfortunately no more, uh, Joseph Emerson. Uh, IQC Waterloo, Aditya Jain, who is a PhD student at IQC, and uh, Stephen Bartlett, who is uh, at the University of Sydney. Okay, so before uh, describing uh, what the research problem is, I just want to put it into perspective of the overarching goal of building a quantum computer to solve a real world problem. This, this evolution of the field has, in my opinion, three can be categorized into three aspects. One is you want to build a physical qubit. So here you want to look at all microscopic effects that happen at the level of quantum systems, study the physics of quantum systems, and see how we can build a two-level system in the interest of building a qubit. And then comes the era of what if we have a handful of these systems, this otherwise called the NISC era, where we say, okay, what if I have 100 physical qubits or a thousand physical qubits, what important tasks can I do? And what interesting information can I infer for the future? And then is the ultimate goal of having trillions and tens of trillions of these physical qubits to build a real world quantum computer and scale up these resources for real world problems. And much of my talk today is going to lie in this intermediate yeah. era, which is which is so far the most interesting because it has some overlap with experiments and theoretical advances. In particular, what I'll be talking in this era is I'll be telling you about quantum error correction, which is by now about 15 to 20 years old as a theoretical field. I will tell you about how it can be studied going beyond the theoretical paradigm, which is considering Pauli errors that is traditionally done in quantum error correction. And then I will tell you about my understanding of what are the fundamental problems in applying these theoretical guarantees to real world noisy quantum hardware. And then I will present you some results uh, on efficiently diagnosing if a quantum error correction scheme is going to work or not without actually having to take up all the time to build it in the lab and then figure it out. Okay, so with that motivation, let's dive into the problem of this talk in a bit more detail. <clears throat> as as uh, we can abstract out, a quantum computer that is tailor-made to solve a real-world problem, at some level, it's nothing but an elaborate quantum circuit. And it turns out that to solve problems of interest, for instance, in this case, to do a quantum chemistry simulation of, say, ion sulfide molecule, these real-world problems in require an enormous amount of resources in terms of physical qubits, the two level systems that need to encode information, and in terms of the gates that you need to build the circuit. For instance, this particular task needs about 10 trillion components. What, what this means is that when each component is so susceptible to interactions with the environment and therefore its state being perturbed from its ideal value, yeah. it means that if there are a few errors in the circuit, this can be catastrophic to the result of the circuit. So what we want is that we want a way of carrying out the circuit in a noise resilient way, in the sense that we have to put up with the fact that yes, there is noise, and we have to deal with noise alongside computing the result of the circuit. So what is 
done in quantum error correction is that we can kind of pictorially view each wire of this qubit not as a single wire but as a cable that contains several yeah. wires as several physical qubits in other words what we are doing is we are taking the information encoded in each unit of the, of physical system and distributing across several other physical qubits so we are taking a single qubit state and representing it as an entangled system of many physical qubits this technique is called an encoding scheme and essentially what it guarantees is that in this scheme if a few of these physical qubits undergo some noise process interact with the environment like say undergo fluctuating electric fields or magnetic fields i can still by some classical post processing recover the state that i initially intended to store in these physical qubits so this is quantum error correction in a nutshell some of the technical terms that we will use are the rate of error that physical qubits undergo namely called the physical error rate and the the effective error that it imparts on the stored logical information otherwise called the logical error rate so as you can as you can guess we want the logical error rate to be as low as possible ideally zero uh, so the real game is given a physical error rate how much can i suppress the logical error rate and uh, and these kind of these kind of this kind of information is best delivered with a plot of this nature where on the y axis clearly you have the quantity you want to suppress on the x axis you have the quantity that occurs in nature so these kind of plots are called performance plots in quantum error correction they have been there like ever since error correcting codes were invented to figure out how good they are so often in this plot we have an we have a region of interest that's decided by the application say we have a quantum algorithm that requires n gates just at the very coarse level you want the logical error rate to be at least less than 1 over n so in this case let's say we want to simulate an iron sulfide molecule with a with a lot of components and let's say our target error rate is 10 raised to minus 13 clearly turns out that if we just use 10 physical qubits we are nowhere nowhere near that target in terms of suppressing the logical error rate what quantum error correction prescribes is use more resources and it turns out that if you use more you get a better suppression so you can keep doing this keep doing this and at the cost of adding more redundancy you are suppressing the logical error rate further and further at some point it's going to be just beyond the reach of current near term experiments in terms of the resources so then what you can do is just make engineer just make better and better engineering tools to shield the physical qubit from other types of noise so this is better better physical error rate somehow we want to reach this target and and what the overarching question here is how much overhead and what quality of physical components are needed to achieve a target logical error rate this question motivates the talk today and this distills to another question uh which is specific to what we will answer which is how how can we accurately predict the performance which is predict the y value in this plot of a quantum error correction scheme efficiently using things that we can measure on a hardware device in a lab okay so i gave you a general flavor and the main statement of the problem that we want to study before before going into how we did study this for the experts here let me just dive into the results and kind of excite you a little bit on what what is going to come so the goal of accurately predicting the performance using experimentally available data one as you as expert to know here one of the traditional tools for understanding noise is called a full process tomography what what it means is that noise is anything that is physically valid operation so it maps a density matrix to a density matrix a full process tomography is something that completely tries to reconstruct that map 
as as you could guess that reconstructing this map is a very hard problem in fact it has some numerical instabilities and the fact that the parameter space is too large for us to characterize it if we had characterized so despite the hardness say we had characterized it the second part of the problem is actually to understand the scheme as a mathematical modeling of this noise which involves intensive numerical simulations and sampling problems which is another hard problem for high performance computing so let's say let's say given the two fold hardness we avoid this route and we go to what is available for a device there are several there are several figures of merit that essentially tell you okay i have a hardware device how good is it it's going to be an on an abstract sense a number between 0 and 1 and it's going to tell you 0 means there's no noise and 1 means there is it just destroys the state some candidate metrics figures of merit or diamond distance that most people would have heard of here they are used in several proofs of fault tolerance and then fidelity which is attractive to experimentalists because they can efficiently measure now what we found out in our work is that though diamond distance and fidelity possess their own attractive features for instance diamond distance is a mathematically interesting metric fidelity can be measured the green zone of this table is what we discovered which is none of these available metrics are good enough to predict that y value on the plot which is what suppression of logical error can you get with yeah. physical hardware to and then to to save this problem what we did was we we said forget the standard metrics let us come up with our own figure of merit for a quantum device which we only construct out of experimentally extractable data we call it logical estimator which possesses the important quality of being able to predict what the logical suppression on the error they could be instead of actually going through full process tomography and numerical simulation and that's the that's the end goal of this talk and then a bonus feature of having this new metric is that we can also select between between optimal error correcting schemes we can basically leverage this metric to answer other problems in fault on sorry pavitran can i ask yes. you a very nice question if you don't sure, mind yes, i mean please. in my very limited admittedly understanding i mean there are sort of two types of errors in a sense one pertains to memory and the other pertains to operations so you know if you're just storing some number of physical uh, logical qubits in some code it can be etc and your estimator uh, it works for both in terms of giving yes. you a good predictor of performance both yeah, these are a, okay it's a very good question this estimator uh, uh, the, the for, this estimator is like the start of of hopefully a series of works and this is only for memory noise okay. at the moment okay thank you okay thank you thanks so i gave you i hopefully excited you on the question and gave you the results let's now go step by step into how this is relevant and how we get to the results so first there are two aspects to this to understanding this problem one is the x axis of the plot and one is the y axis x axis is what happens in physics y axis is what happens in logic so let's first understand what happens at the physical level to the physical qubit at the physical level as you all know here density matrices are represented as points on the sphere that's popularly known as a block sphere and any noise operation can be basically viewed as transformations on the sphere the physical origins of this noise can actually come from different hardware settings like superconducting qubit silicon quantum dot hopefully i have not left anything that you would be interested in uh, but what we want to understand is mathematically what all features does this noise have so some popular noise is what is known as a dephasing channel that essentially takes a pure state and goes towards a mixed state it is associated in experiments with t2 time scale and then there is a relaxation noise process yeah. that when yeah. qubits are encoded in two different yeah. energy levels the higher energy level slowly decays to the lower energy level which is mathematically called the amplitude damping noise in general 
any of these noise process can be mathematically modeled as something called a completely positive trace preserving map because it has two properties. It preserves positivity of the input and trace of the input, which are exactly the two that you need to satisfy for a dense screening. And any of these maps can be written in this nice decomposition here. That's called oh. Gauss decomposition. Okay, so these are physically valid noise processes. What do you want to get out of this? We basically want a number that goes between a range where looking at that number, you can actually understand the strength of noise. So what are candidates? One is the diamond distance. That is basically, yes, please. Question. So, you, you're, are you only going to consider uh, noise channels which act on individual qubits, or could, could the noise channel act on multiple qubits at the same time? In, in other words, can it introduce entanglements? Yes, yes. So, for, for the purpose of these metrics, noise channels can act on multiple qubits. For the purpose of our result, we will own, we, we don't assume that noise acts on individual qubits, but we will show an example for the case of noise acting on individual qubits because it's easy to illustrate. Thank you. Uh, so diamond distance is some sort of the worst case error in a channel because it says in the worst case, what is the distance between the input and the output of the channel? And then there is infidelity or, or otherwise one minus fidelity, which is essentially the average trace overlap between the input and the output. And because it's a mathematical object, one can measure L1, L2 norm on this channel, basically maximize it over all input states. And something called the unitarity that's interested, that's interesting to know if it preserves a pure state or not. And uh, there, in general, there's this thing called the choi Jamilkovsky isomorphism, which essentially says you can do a one-to-one -one mapping between channels and states in the interest of using any figure of merit for a state to apply for a channel. Okay, and many more. Now, we have a bunch of these at our disposal. What we want to answer is, does any of these have the quality we are looking for, which is, can they predict the logical error in a quantum error correction scheme? Just to put it in perspective, here are the desirable quantities, we, uh, qualities we need. We want to be able to use it in fault tolerance proofs. We want to measure it in experiments, efficiently compute it numerically, and we want it to predict the logical error rate. Well, it turns out diamond distance has the first property. It's the only one that does. Fidelity is the only one that has the second property. All of them can, but the diamond distance can be fortunately computed efficiently but we don't know if any of them have the property we are looking for, which is, can they predict the logical error? So let's go ahead and test this property first. Okay, so we, we saw what physical noise processes are and we saw what quality we are looking for in these physical noise processes. Now, now let us go and look into a bit more detail on what is it that we want to predict or we want to estimate. This is the logical error rate. And let's now look more detail into how to, how to understand this logical error rate. So as we saw in our little cartoon, that, that quantum error correcting code in a nutshell is basically taking the information that we intended to store in a physical qubit and distributing it across several physical qubits into a many body entangled state. So in mathematically, what this means is that you take, there is a particular yeah. unitary operation that does this job, which yeah. is it takes a single qubit and this unitary operation is called an encoder. So it takes a single qubit and then maps it onto an n qubit yeah. state in a specific way that's decided by a quantum error correcting scheme. Once, once we have encoded our information, the entire quantum computing is done wow. directly on the encoded information because that is the noise resilient way to do it. Mathematically, noise now occurs on the physical qubits in the encoded state. And then we have wow. a quantum error correction scheme, which is split into two parts. First, we want to know if there's an error, which is called error detection. And this is done using, using measurements that we can do 
non-destructive measurements that we can do on the n qubit state, which are otherwise called single no. measurements in error correction. This gives us some classical yeah. information on what the errors could be. And now no. having that classical information, we feed it into a classical computer that prescribes yeah. an operation that we can do actively on the quantum system to hopefully get rid of the error. There's a lot of probabilistic steps involved here. And that's why you will see that this process is not guaranteed to get rid of all the errors. And that is what we want to understand. Did it get rid of all the errors or not? In other words, we want to basically extract the information that is stored after this entire process and compare it with the initial information and see how far am I from the initial state. And this essentially tells us how much of a gain did I get from noise plus quantum error correction? And this is what we want to compare to the case of having no access to quantum error correction at all. So this, this accounting is a particular channel that you're going to do? I'm sorry? Uh, I was just asking this logical recovery. Is a particular, it's a fixed channel that you're going to do? Yes. So for the purpose of, uh, for in the interest of being actually able to do it in practice, we restrict recoveries to Pauli operations. Okay. Because not only because it's easy, because uh, we, we don't have to actively do it. We can track it in classical software uh, uh, across Clifford Gates. Thanks, thanks. So just for the experts, I've given each of these steps as mathematical equations too, but I don't, I, I'm, I don't insist on understanding these for the purpose of the talk. So now we can black box the entire scenario and say, here is my effective channel and effective means noise plus quantum error correction. And that's the little subscript, superscript one, which says I've done one round of quantum error correction. So I want to compare doing nothing to doing one round of quantum error correction. And and this effective channel is not something we have discovered. This has been used extensively. Okay, so we said one round, nothing prevents us from doing this over and over again, which is we take a single physical qubit, write it as an entangled state of many physical qubits, take each of the single physical qubits in that entangled state and again express it as an entangled state of several other physical qubits. As you can clearly see, uh, this suggests the obvious name of a concatenation scheme where you're just concatenating several of these identical procedures. And if you do it L times, this is in literature known as a level L concatenated code. The nice thing is that it has a nice tree-like structure, which is you can take one error, one error correcting code and every physical qubit is actually another code block of another error correcting code. These may not be the same, but for this talk, you be, let's assume that they're just the same. So it's a, it's a nice kind of a renormalization structure. And once you have done it L time, the hope is that each time we are going to suppress the logical error rate little by little, and we'll do it sufficiently enough time to suppress the logical error rate to the target that we want. Once we have done it, now noise acts directly on these physical qubits and we want to study the effect of this noise. We will use a mathematical black boxing tool where we will start from the last layer and keep abstracting out every, every such encoding layer into this effective channel. So if we keep doing that, we will start with epsilon superscript one, then we'll go to two and so on and so on and so on. If we do it L times, we will end up with uh, epsilon uh, L folded time. And essentially what we want to understand is how much noise was there in the bare physical qubit versus how much noise is effectively imparted by this level L folded channel, which is the effective channel of the level L concatenated code. Okay, so we basically said how to map a noise at physical hardware to noise on the logical qubit. Now that we have a mathematical model of the noise on the hard on the logical qubit, 
we can just go ahead and say, okay, I will choose one of the figures of merit to represent the logical noise strength. So now I have physical noise strength and logical noise strength. I have all the ingredients I need to compare them. Now I've given you a flavor, but if you actually want to compute this logical channel, it is it has some other nuances that unfortunately we won't go into this talk. I have them as additional slides if someone is interested, but they're all abstracted into uh, uh, a detailed numerical simulator that we built for uh, CPTP maps that one can go into this GitHub page and find it. Okay, so now we put physical channels into this mathematical uh, step and it gives out a logical channel on which we can compute several noise strengths. It doesn't matter what noise strength we compute because they are they all have monotonic properties, but in the interest of eventually being able to under, measure it uh, experimentally, let's say we choose fidelity on the logical table. So, before error correction, we have physical error rates. After error correction, we have logical error rates. The question is, are, are the ones on the left correlated with the ones on the right? Okay, so hopefully I've conveyed what is noise at the physical level and noise at the logical level. Now let's go ahead and compare these two. So, Abstractly, the question we want to answer is someone comes and gives me a hardware device and says, I have a hardware device whose noise strength or whose fidelity is 99% or the diamond distance is say the complement of that, let's say 1%. So essentially the person wants to know, can, can I use them, use these devices in a fault tolerant quantum algorithm? I have to basically say, if, if there's a quantum error correction scheme in mind, does does this quality allow me to achieve that threshold error rate that I need for the algorithm to work in the presence of noise? So, sorry, Pavitran, can I ask you sure. another naive question? Sure, please. Uh, please. So I, I, I understand that you will use these different uh, measures for seeing how good the error correction is, maybe yes. say fidelity or something. But what yes. are you assuming about the nature of the errors in the first place? That is, you said something perhaps, and I didn't. So you said something perhaps about poly errors. Did you mean they were all single qubit or, or no? What are you assuming? Or, or is it, yes. do you, you can make a statement without such assumptions? Sorry. Yes, so so uh, yes, there are some assumptions. Uh, we are assuming the most generic noise process on a single qubit. Okay. But for the purpose of this illustration, we are not assuming correlations across qubits. However, any all these results in in their most rig, in their rigorous form can be applied to the most general noise on n qubits, which is okay. n body correlation. I see, I see. Okay, but, thank you. But uh, since it's easy to describe sure. the identical case, I would choose them. Sure. So okay, thank what, you, thank you. what we will see right now is what measure of physical noise strength can be used to obtain an accurate estimate of the logical noise strength. Okay, so now let's dive into the results. The results will basically compare these two quantities, physical and logical noise strength, in a plot of this nature, where every point on this plot, will, in the coordinate is going to tell me the physical yeah. energy, and the y is going to tell me the logical error rate, much like the plot we saw in the initial slide. Now, hopefully, hopefully the plot is, is such that for a given physical error rate, there are not too many logical error rates because then I'm unsure of what the exact logical error rate is for that physical error rate. So I don't want to spread like this in the y direction. I want technically something that looks like a line because if there's a spread like this, I can say that if I only, if you only give me the figure of merit, I can, I, my uncertainty on what the exact logical error rate is equivalent to the spread of this plot. In other words, I can quantify it using some dispersion metric. This is kind of an ad hoc metric just to show you, give you a flavor of the amount of dispersion. And this metric is essentially the, the max over min 
for a given x value. So it's going to tell you if I just know what the physical error rate is one percent, there is a delta spread, which hopefully is not several orders of magnitude. Okay, so let's go into the results. Let's take the first popular candidate, which is the diamond distance. Now, what we have done is we have numerically sampled, uh, in this case, about 18,000 physically valid CPTP maps on n qubits. And n here is n equals uh, 7 tensor 3 times, so 343 qubits. It's a steam, it's just for this example, it's a concatenated steam code, which encodes one logical qubit into 343 physical qubits. This is to show that if you, if you have a value of diamond distance, say someone tells me the diamond distance of a hardware device is 10% and that's all the information I have. Now, if I try to infer what the logical error rate is from this large ensemble of physically valid noise processes I constructed for that 10% diamond distance, my uncertainty is about eight orders of magnitude, which means that, which means that I, will, uh, I will be unable to say if this logical, if this physical error rate is sufficient to build a fault tolerance scheme or not. And for the experts here, you might be interested in okay, for a given physical distance, what's the best and the worst type of error you can have? And it turns out that the best type of error you can have is coherent noise that actually preserves the pure state. And the worst type of error you can have is incoherent noise. Now let's turn to the other metric that is popular, which is fidelity. So here the question is, Let's say we, we come across some, uh, some device whose fidelity is 93%. The question is, can I use these to build a fault tolerance scheme? In other words, what will the logical error rate be for this concatenated steam error correction scheme? It turns out again that there is a considerably large spread. Means that fidelity alone can tell us very little about what the logical error rate is. It's about six orders of magnitude. And, and this essentially means that fidelity is not a good metric to estimate the logical error. Interestingly enough, if you ask the same question of, okay, given just the fidelity, what is the worst type of device I can have and the best type of device? In other words, the worst type of error and the best type of error, it's completely reversed. There's a quick question. Uh, so different, you get the same physical error rate, you get different points on the y-axis. Is that because you have different error channels? Yes, yes. Each each point here is a physically valid error channel. And its x-axis is the physical error rate and y is the logical error rate. And we have considered a random ensemble of several error channels here. So what you see on the but how do you find the distribution over the error channel? Sorry? How do you, how do you determine how the sample error channel is? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's a good question. Yeah. So these error channels, CPTP maps, can be understood uh, as, as a unitary on a larger Hilbert space. So the it comes from the Stein spring dilation of the CPTP map. And what we do to sample these CPTP maps is we sample random unitary processes, understanding them as a time spring dilation and do a cross decomposition to get the single qubit CPTC now. Thanks. S sorry, Pavitra, can I, I yeah, sorry no, to no. ask so many nice questions, but no, just no, to no. get an understanding of what is going on, is it, sure. I mean, why is it that say a given value for the fidelity is resulting in such a big spread? Is it roughly like this that fidelity is a measure of how well you are doing the error correction when you kind of average over all possible errors? So that's kind of a mean estimate and this is giving you a sense of the variance as you change your errors. Is, is it something like that? Yes, exactly, exactly. So in, in the most generic sense, uh, as, as I, will, uh, I will show in the later slides that to completely specify a physical noise process, you need 12 independent parameters. And 
effectively fidelity can be understood as just one of them. Okay. So it is these 11 parameters that we can study in some space that are completely oblivious to fidelity and varying them results in this Y spread. And it's similar for diamond distance. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so here, if you ask what is the best and the worst type of error channel, the, the scenario reverses where the worst now is coherent errors, which was best according to the diamond distance. And the best now is incoherent errors, which was worst according to the rest. So it kind of means that if, if you give me a metric, I can tell you what is the best error channel for that metric, which kind of invalidates the, the trust you can associate to a metric. Okay, so let's let's kind of jump back to our big picture. We basically said that given these physical standard error metrics, we cannot accurately predict the logical noise trend. And this uh, this is essentially the this uh, is one of the important components of my PhD work, and it's uh, and we we decided on say concluding that we cannot use classical simulations to estimate performance of quantum computers. So we need a small quantum computer to optimize fault tolerance protocols for a larger quantum computer. Okay, so let's now see how we, uh, how I, I'll now tell you about how we proceeded forward into discovering this new metric that, that achieves the properties that the standard metrics fail to achieve. So this comes in a two-fold strategy. Let's go back to our problem. We wanted to predict the performance of a quantum error correction scheme accurately and efficiently using experimental data. Now, I, schematically what we will achieve doing is we will do a two-step process where first, let's simplify the problem. We, our noise is very generic, the most generic it can be in, in the sense of just respecting the physics of quantum systems which is 12 independent parameters for a physical qubit. Let's simplify that problem to, to act, actively casting that noise into Pauli noise. And fortunately, there is a technique for this purpose called randomized compiling. So once we have taken a circuit and, and applied this tool called randomized compiling, what it effectively does is any noise that, that the memory is undergoing in that circuit is effectively reduced to a Pauli noise on the memory. Once we have done it, we want to completely characterize this Pauli noise model using a tool called noise reconstruction, which what it says is that if all the noise that's going on in the system is a Pauli noise model, you can completely characterize the individual rates of the Pauli errors occurring in the system. And once we have this ingredient, we want to basically say, okay, I have completely characterized my noise channel. Can I use this information to not do numerical simulations, but efficiently approximate the result of the numerical simulation, which is the logical error rate. And doing so entails effectively approximating the total probability of all error processes on which the code is bound to fail. And, and the, this, this entire process was, uh, was published in a recent work called Efficient Diagnostics for Quantum Error Correction. So let's go back uh, into physical noise processes. It turns out that a single qubit CPTP map, just on single qubit, for the multi-qubit case, it's just worse. For a single qubit case, it turns out that completely characterizing a transformation on a density matrix requires 12 independent parameters. Uh, one might wonder why 12. So it turns out that you can look at density matrices as vectors where, where the individual components of vectors are Pauli matrices because Pauli matrices form a basis for two by two Hermitian matrices. And now for a single qubit, it's, it's four parameters that go into a vector where each component is, a poly, is associated to a Pauli matrix, essentially the block sphere also. And therefore, 
quantum channels can be seen as affine transformation on this vector space. And therefore, we have a four by four matrix. But it's not just any transformation. It's transformation that preserves positivity and transformation that preserves trace. Both of these conditions reduce the 16 parameter space to a 12 parameter space. And as, as just to recap, we have diamond distance and average gate fidelity, which can be understood as one of these 12 parameters in some unitary equivalence. So now randomized compiling, effectively what it does is it takes this four by four matrix and removes the off diagonal element in this representation. And by and it does it actively, which means that after randomized compiling has been applied, all the noise occurs can be understood by these four numbers. And there is noise reconstruction a method. What it does is it essentially queries this noise process with different inputs such that each of these inputs are only affected by one of these noise components, such that by doing a series of measurements, one can estimate each of these values, chi 1, 1, chi 2, 2, chi 3, 3, and chi 4, 4. Once we have estimated these values, we have completely got an understanding of what the noise is on the physical table. Okay, so just to give you a rough idea of what randomized compiling entails, it, it does this mathematical operation called twirling. Twirling is a group theoretic operation. So here what happens is if you have, if you have an operator and you essentially apply twirling with respect to a group, the, the, the result of twirling come is, is in the commutant of this group, which means that if I twirl with respect to Pauli operators, the result of twirling commutes with every Pauli operator, which means the result of twirling has to be a Pauli channel. That is the gist of this argument. So what we do is we take our circuit, anything that we want to implement, let's say a quantum error correction circuit, and we apply random Pauli gates before and after every gate in the circuit. And if we ideally go through the entire Pauli group, what happens is that effectively we have Pauli noise acting on all the components of the circuit. This procedure exists for physical qubits. What? And it has these attractive features that whenever you are doing just Pauli gates, you're not actually doing them on hardware because they have nice properties that they, they preserve, they, they essentially, uh, they essentially uh, remain with, they essentially form a group. So they remain Pauli going through any Clifford gate element. You need not do any of these Pauli gates until you have a non-Clifford gate in the circuit. So this way of twirling actually introduces no additional cost. And it's a noise-free way of reducing any complex process to a Pauli error process. We basically applied this idea to a quantum error correction scheme where we said we will apply random Pauli operators and silently absorb these all the operators into the quantum error correction scheme itself and push it into classical post-processing, which for this moment, we assume classical computers have no noise in them. So effectively, we have reduced all the noise that happens at the complex level on n physical qubits into just Pauli noise on these n physical qubits. The second problem. Once we have completely understood this Pauli noise, how can we understand what the logical error rate is? Because that's the end goal. Now, this entails counting through all Pauli errors and adding up their probabilities, only those under which the error correcting code fails or only those under which the error correcting code succeeds because these are complements of each other. And this is what we call the total probability of uncorrectable error. Now, it turns out that for any code of interest, there is an exponentially large number of errors that the code can correct or not correct. So it does not, it's not a viable process for us to enumerate all these errors and add up their probabilities in an exact manner. And this 
this demands a way of estimating this quantity in a clever way and we can only do it given some more information about the error correcting scheme and that is what we leverage in this result we we make use of the fact that our error correction scheme has this nice tree like structure which means if i compute this quantity for one level of the tree i can hopefully recurse it and compute it for the entire tree that's the idea and that way of recursion does not give me the exact quantity of interest which is the total number of uncorrectable errors but it gives me an efficient approximation to it which we call the logical estimator so the logical estimator is an approximation to the logical error rate under the assumption of randomized compiling and uh, in 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 the published version we actually rigorously prove that the logical estimator we bound the distance between the logical estimator and the true logical error rate okay so now we have this new quantity let's see how good it is let's go back to our old plot where we saw the variation of the physical error with respect to the logical error now in this plot as uh, it's the same format as the previous plot except we have two colors here because there are two quantities we want to compare so let's focus on the gray on the gray dots the, each of these dots represent a physical channel and its top axis represents the standard error metric which is the physical gate infidelity and the y spread in these gray dots tells you how much the physical gate infidelity can vary for this ensemble of channels and and the dispersion plot here essentially quantifies that information it says that the physical gate infidelity can vary about an order of magnitude here whereas now we compare instead of physical gate infidelity what if i had access to this new estimator which is the logical estimator it turns out that i can get a much much clearer estimate of the logical error rate with access to the logical estimator and in fact i get a factor of 10 improvement with respect to the fidelity now a similar but drastic conclusion is with the diamond distance where i see that i get i get about a fact uh, just to exaggerate the scenario i can say a factor of 10 million improvement but at least a factor of 1000 improvement with respect to the predictive nature of the diamond distance on the logical error rate versus the logical estimator on the logical error rate so this clearly sets a picture where logical estimator is much more of a useful quantity to measure on a hardware device as opposed to any of the standard metrics that were known before uh now you might wonder why i'm only considering these two examples in in my uh, phd thesis which is a lengthier work we have essentially compared each of the physical each of the standard metrics that have been known in literature to uh and compare its predictive power on the logical error rate okay so hopefully i have told you what the standard metrics lack in answering our problem and what the logical estimator possesses in answering our problem and therefore set the importance of the logical estimator now let's see now we have a very useful quantity that can tell us with very little effort in terms of not having to do numerical simulations or full process tomography what the logical error rate is let's see how we can exploit this this quantity one of the important things we can do is we can go back to our error correction scheme and say can i use this quantity to to quickly to quickly rate between error correcting schemes and say this scheme is better than this for this hardware setting and that's that's an illustration i'm going to show right now so given given a physical error model or a hardware device we want to know which code or a quantum error correction scheme is optimal for that setting of the logical qubit and here by what is the best code we want to know which code will give you the least logical error rate 
we're not interested in what the logical error rate specifically is. We just want to know which of them will give you the lesser of the logical error rate. As you know, estimating the logical error rates numerically, if we didn't have logical estimator is exponentially hard. And because the logical estimator is a good proxy, let's study one such problem. Here is a problem where let's say I had access to just seven cubes or a concatenation scheme where each of the blocks have seven qubits. Uh, there are two choices I can, I can take up. One is this popularly known Steen error rating code. The other one is the recently discovered cyclic code, which is based off the XZZX surface code, if uh, the experts here would know. Um, these two have exactly the same resources, but prescribe different ways of encoding a logical qubit. And I want to understand which is better for my hardware device. And let us let me take a popular example where I have calibration errors on my device, which are essentially small rotations about a poly axis. And I have all possible rotations with different probabilities. And let me imagine a scenario where, where I, slowly, I slowly sweep the noise regime where I bias between the, the uh, phase and bit rota uh, rotations as I sweep my noise regime. So at low noise, I have high rate of phase rotations and at high noise, I have high rate of bit rotations. Z and X rotations. It's important to know in which regime should I use which code. And if we look at the dotted plot here, it's, it's something that that answers this question, but actually by doing, by extracting the entire information about the noise and simulating quantum error correction on a classical computer. This took several days on a high performance cluster. Now we want to see if, if we can avoid doing this, which is can we use the logical estimator to answer the same question? Firstly, what question does it answer? It says that the logical error rate is actually lower for, for the blue, which is the Steen error correction scheme, when, when the bias between the Z and the X is lower. And the logical error rate for the other scheme, which is the cyclic code, is lower when the bias between the Z and the X is higher. So it says that, it says that if you know the exact value of the bias, you can be clever about what scheme you want to choose to get a better suppression on the logical error rate. This is what the numerical simulations have revealed. Now we want to see if the logical estimator that actually takes just a couple of seconds on a laptop because it's a linear time algorithm in the number of physical qubits. We want to see if it delivers the same conclusion. And we found that it does indeed, in the sense that it, it is quite accurate in predicting the crossing point, which is really the point at which one scheme becomes better than the other scheme. So here, if you see the crossing point, it says that beyond that bias, it's better to use the cyclic code as opposed to the steam code. And, and uh, by doing this clever search, we actually get several orders of improvement on the logical aspect, which says that this choice is very crucial to realizing a near-term quantum computer. Okay. So uh, I have showed you what the logical estimator has in terms of accurately predicting the logical error rate and one way of using that information to choose between quantum error rating schemes and optimize the resources we have to achieve better and better suppression of error on the logical table. With, with that, I would I, I just want to conclude this and hopefully I've delivered the main ideas and just reiterate on the points we went through. So let's go back to our main question. Uh, I have a hardware device. How can I find out if this device can be used in a quantum uh, error correction scheme, otherwise a fault tolerant quantum algorithm? What we prescribe is first do a randomized compiling actively on the hardware device to eliminate noise sources other than Pauli error. And then we compute the logical estimator. If the estimator, which is a good proxy to the actual logical error rate, 
passes the cutoff that we need for the application, then we are all good. And as a side, as a side bonus, we can also use this estimator to not only answer question for a particular error correction scheme, but we can also tell you what the best error correction scheme would be. Okay, so so far all the work we have done is for this recursive structure of encoding, which is concatenated codes. The immediate question is, can we do this on more popularly known quantum hardware, like say for the one that Google is building or IBM is building, which is based on superconducting qubits, where we essentially don't care about the recursive structure, but we want these physical qubits to physically sit on a chip. And these are these architectures are popularly known as surface codes or topological stabilizer codes. And for these architectures, we proposed an extension of this uh, of this logical estimator that can be found in the supplementary material of this uh, of this work. And uh, and then we want to see, okay, we extract all this information from the hardware device, but only compute one number, which is the logical estimator. Can we use this information that we anyway extracted to improve the performance of this recovery operation, which is otherwise called decoding in quantum error correction? And this is something we are currently working on. And we want to we wanted to answer this important question of okay, we made a good job at predicting the logical error rate. Can we accurately make the logical error rate worse? in the course of this predicting, because we, we were actively applying a noise tailoring technique, which was getting rid of noise sources. Now, it's kind of counterintuitive to think that by getting rid of noise sources, I am going to make performance any worse because I'm only getting rid of noise sources. But it turns out that due to some interesting consequences, this is not always the case. For coherent errors though, we, we could prove that randomized compiling not only predicts the performance well, but also enhances the performance of error correcting codes. But for some complex noise models, we showed that although randomized compiling eliminates noise, it can still lead to a de it can still lead to a higher logical error rate on the logical qubit. Someone is interested, I can go a little detail into that. But uh, we just finished this work and here's a preprint of it. Uh, then we, uh, I'm also independently interested in understanding what if we do noise, uh, randomized compiling, in other words, this twirling operation in group theory, not with the entire polygroup, but with a small subset of the polygroup. What happens is that you don't get a Pauli channel which is just four parameters, you get somewhere between four and 12 parameters and can be understood as a decoherence free subspace for a particular quantum error correction code. We want to see how much of a gain in prediction can we get from this decoherence free subspace. And uh, the, I, I'm also interested in uh, some technique, so speeding up some numerical simulation techniques for fault tolerance schemes that involve important sampling that I have completely not gone into. And if someone is interested, I'm most happy to describe that in a nice way. And uh, because uh, we, we made some progress with surface codes, we stumbled upon this interesting decoder for surface codes that's actually based on renormalization group, kind of ties very old physics ideas with uh, new concepts in quantum error correction. And uh, we have some leads on how to extend it beyond the paradigm of surface codes to something called low density parity check codes that are that are the holy grail for fault tolerance. Okay, so I just want to uh, have a conclusion here by going back to the big picture of how quantum computing can be characterized into these three steps and uh, tell you a little bit of what I have done in the other aspects of uh, this process just to just to tell you that i'm most happy to discuss at length if you have uh, any interesting ideas or questions here so in terms of understanding just the physical qubit and how to engineer a physical qubit from hardware devices 
I have worked. I am currently working uh, as a scientist in a company where we are trying to engineer a qubit using phases of light. Otherwise, uh, on optical hardware using an encoding scheme called Gottesman Kitai Freskin or GKT code. I've uh, worked on uh, engineering qubits in optical cavities using uh, this encoding scheme called CAT codes and and detailing out a fault tolerance scheme using CAT codes. In the in the era of having just a handful of physical qubits, I've, in addition to what I described, I've also studied this interesting problem where, let's say in quantum error correction, you have real world hardware. So when I said like you detect an error, Maybe like it's not an instantaneous process. These happen, these happen, the detection happens inside a dilution fridge and you need to get the output of, out of the fridge. So there's a time delay in doing this process. What happens to the actual quantum information in this time delay? It's an interesting problem. So I've looked at fault tolerance schemes in the presence of slow measurement. And uh, I've also, considered some nuances in directly doing randomized benchmarking on the logical qubit. And on the scaling up side, I have done some asymptotic studies to characterize computational complexity of decoding stabilizer codes. So this is this is proving very asymptotic results on whether decoding stabilizer codes is in general a conceivable problem or not. And I've, I've proposed some generalized schemes to understand surface codes and some linear time decoders for the for specific types of noise called erasures. And I'm currently working on this interesting problem where we are trying to get uh, design decoders for large LDPC codes using ideas from tensor groups. Uh, with this, I just want to leave it there. Uh, and uh, open it up for questions. I'm most happy to answer not only questions from what I presented, but uh, anything in the last few slides too. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions from the Zoom audience? Uh, okay, so if not any any questions from the audience here. Uh, so uh, I have questions. When, when you just define the is about the definition of the randomized uh, compiling. Okay, I'm sorry, Omkar. Do, do you mind repeating it? I'm so sorry. No, there's a little bit of echo. So, so this was a, a question about the compiling actually. So you said that the full error CPT uh, map is well parameter. You're restricting to a four parameter sub sub space. So does that mean you are considering only certain kinds of errors, or is that all kinds of errors are still included in some effective yes, ran yes, randomized compiling is a process that can be applied to the fully generic noise model. So it includes correlations. What happens if you have correlations, which is multiple qubits, is that it no longer reduces to just four parameters. It would be four raised to n, which would be the number of qubits in the model. So it would be four raised to n parameters. This is an excellent question because you might say, for a single qubit, you have just four parameters. So everything is all size. So estimating the logical estimator is easy. What if you have n physical qubits, in which case you have four to the n parameters. So the amount of information I need to extract itself is an exponentially large set. In this case, in, in, the, in the extended work in the paper that I mentioned, we have also considered the, uh, the case where you extract only a limited amount of information of these four to the n parameters. And with that, how well can you estimate the logical uh, logical error rate or how well can you estimate the logical estimate itself? and it turns out it's good enough with a constant number of parameters and there are any parameters for the single qubit uh, and that also does not matter yes 
so if we have let's say uh, so if if you have like uh, two physical uh, two physical qubits there will be 16 if you have n physical qubits it will be 4 to the n but we showed that as as n grows the number of parameters that you need to efficiently approximate the logical estimator kind of tapers off to a constant okay thanks So I believe there are no further questions. Uh, so let's thank Pavitran once again. Thank you so much, and uh, please uh, reach out to me either by email or uh, uh, through my web page. I'd be most happy to answer any questions. Sure, sounds great. Thanks a lot, to Pavitran, for the thank talk. You. Thank you. Thank you. Give us the talk. No worries at all. No worries at all. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks to all the audience. Thank you so much.